This is House Planning Help episode 355. Hello, I'm Ben Adam Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you're interested in self-build or retrofit. I'm exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century and trying to break down the major roadblocks that may get in our way. Coming up in this session, it's the return of Lloyd Alter. We're talking about his new book, The Story of Upfront Carbon. What is Upfront Carbon? Why should we care? How is it applicable to our projects and what we do? That is coming up. I should mention, though, that this episode is not entirely on housing. It's bigger picture because Upfront Carbon is generated by all of our activities and endeavours. And so we probably should reference Lloyd's first book. We also did a podcast on this, so we'll link everything in. Living the 1.5 degree lifestyle, why individual climate action matters more than ever. And I really enjoyed that. Tried to embrace some of the lessons, as I suppose we maybe all do as we head through life. Some things are easier than others, that is for sure. And I thought I'd insert a fun fact here, because later on we're going to be talking about burgers as part of this. And I am still yet to eat at a drive through There we go. That's my fun fact. Or spell the word through, T-H-R-U. Never done that either. But for me, that's not difficult. I'm not really challenging myself. It's much harder to do some of the other things. In fact, I think the things that Lloyd perhaps has found a challenge to, one of them being flying. So let's get into our conversation. I started by asking Lloyd for a recap of his last book and what lessons he'd turned into habits since then. Well, that book came about after reading a report that said we all have to try to live a 1.5 degree lifestyle, which means emitting on average across the world 2.5 tonnes of carbon per capita in 2030, getting down to one tonne per capita at 2050. And so I tried to live that 2.5 tonne limit, which comes out to 6.8 eight kilograms per day of carbon emissions and changed my life to do that. I had it easier the year that I was doing it because there was a pandemic. So I wasn't able to go out and burn a lot of carbon easily and I couldn't fly very much. When you ask what have I done that I still maintain from that book, well, I'm talking to you in in London, so I've clearly gotten on airplanes, and the one airplane flight is equivalent to about four months of carbon. It would have eaten up a third of my year, so this isn't something that you can do regularly. I do occasionally have red meat, but not very often. It's off the menu. I don't buy nearly as much stuff as I used to. I'm very, very careful. I never look at anything without thinking, I shouldn't be doing this maybe because of the carbon footprint. Right now, this is a silly story. You know, I was asked to come here to speak at two conferences, and I'm being interviewed by the BBC on Monday about kitchen design, and I came here wearing really crappy clothing and walked by the store and bought a suit. You can see it hanging there, the first one I've bought in 30 years. And then you fall into this thing that's called the Diderot effect, that if you've got a nice suit, well, maybe you need a nice shirt to go with it and shoes. No, I'm not buying new shoes. No, I'm not doing this. Oh, you better get a haircut. I got a haircut. You know, once you fall into consumption, it's very, very difficult to get out of it. And so uh, I probably shouldn't have bought that suit, but here I am. I try to do my best as well with a lot of the decisions I make. I I suppose I can only hope that each year that goes by that we're on an improvement line (laughs) rather than falling off the wagon. I can definitely say this is my last suit. (laughs) (laughs) okay so that was the last book we'll put a link in the show notes to the chat about that because it's well worth doing but you didn't stop there in fact you came out of it almost with this idea thinking i know exactly what i've got to do next so why well because what i learned in my first book is where i started measuring every teaspoon of milk that went in my coffee and saying, oh, I've got to switch to oat, and all of these little things that are a couple of grams of carbon, but that what made the big difference were the big things, and primarily they were consumption-based. If you buy a car, you're 
buying 14 tons of upfront carbon emissions, the emissions of making that car. Everything you buy has these issues, and people would talk about efficiency, 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 but efficiency is pointless without sufficiency, without deciding how much do you really need, or as the phrase really what by Samuel Alexander, the Australian philosopher, is efficiency without sufficiency is lost. It's meaningless. So you can use my favorite example, say, I'm going to build a super efficient passive house. But if you build it at 500 square meters, you're using a lot of material. And because its energy is measured on a square meter basis, you're using 10 times as much energy in a 500 meter square building than you are in a 50 meter square building. So sufficiency really matters far more than we give it credit for. And that's why this book has its subtitle, How a Life of Just Enough Offers a Way Out of the Climate Crisis. I'm sure during this conversation, we'll get to grips with what that might mean. But any tips at this stage? What is just enough? Well, I did find in my last book, for instance, in transportation, that we are in the middle of an electric transportation revolution where e-bikes let older people, people who aren't as fit or people who just have to go further or people who live with hills do things that were almost impossible to do on a regular basis, comfortably on a bicycle. And in my year and in my life since, I just basically stopped driving a car and use an e-bike for everything. It is sufficient. And people say, oh, you can't go to a lumber yard and that and all of these things that you need cars for. But you can afford, if you're not paying for a car, to have them deliver it for you. You know, this infrastructure all exists. You can cope without a pickup truck, and even in North America. So sufficiency is just deciding what is enough to do the job. I have an iPhone 11 Pro. I used to get every upgrade of every Apple product as soon as it came out. The iPhone 11 Pro was the first that came out with a wide angle lens and taking pictures of buildings and inside rooms and that, I just jumped at that 11 Pro. But I look at every new camera since and say, what has Apple done to entice me to upgrade to the 12, 13, 14 or 15? And when I start weighing it against A, the money, they're expensive, and B, the carbon, well, every year that I keep that 11 going, I'm amortizing that upfront carbon over a longer period, and it's getting less and less and less. So that's what you have to do. You have to get things that are good quality. You have to maintain them properly. You have to keep them as long as you possibly can. That's like the single best thing that you can do to actually reduce your emissions. When you had your iPhone and you were replacing it each year, what happened to the one that you'd just finished with? Because was it just handed down the chain? Are you actually making any difference at all? Oh, because Apple does take them back. They do recondition them and they do sell them. This is, in fact, a significant point that they do last longer than you think. But you're still creating the need for the input. The new one has to be made. They've got to go find the rare earths. They've got to go find the titanium that they make the case out of. So even though my old one is still going, we have to reduce primary demand for all of this stuff. We have to say, okay, maybe the world doesn't need the iPhone 15 or the newest MacBook. Like, I do word processing. I can't imagine needing to replace my little MacBook Air ever, really. It does what I need for what I do. So this is the problem because, yes, my old iPhone, I don't need to feel guilty that it's just going into a shredder or into the garbage. But I do have to worry about the materials that are being mined to create the new one. And you'd have to worry as well if it just sat in a drawer after you'd finished with it, which I think a lot of them do. I have met this guy who has helped me with some computer issues I've had. And he basically says, all these computers are absolutely fine. There's nothing, no problem with them. You just need to know how to speed them up and do all these things. So it is a case of keeping them going. But I have another question here because I've got a car that's 15 years old, that's diesel. I was told at the time that this was the way to go. And I just look at it and think, 
should I be replacing this? Should I keep it going? It's a little car. I don't use it that much. It does the job. Should I keep it or should I get my new electric one? Well, this is a very difficult analysis to do, but it totally comes down to the number of miles or kilometers a year that you drive. If you drive, for instance, like we do in our house, where because I live in a part of town where we can get everything within walking distance and only use the car really in summer, we're putting like 5,000 kilometers on it per year. If I said, okay, I want to buy a new Tesla, I'll get the smallest one, the Model 3. It's got 14 tons of upfront carbon emissions for making the car. Even though the electricity in Ontario, Canada, where I live, is very clean, almost all coming from hydroelectric and nuclear. So once I own that Tesla, it's the cleanest car on the road. But I have this eight-year-old Subaru and... If I amortize out those 5,000 kilometers a year, it doesn't make sense to replace it. It just keeps going. It's a wonderful car. And if I was driving like 30,000 kilometers a year, it would be a completely different story on the carbon emissions. But you've got to take those carbon emissions from making the Tesla. You've got to amortize them over the life of the car. And you'll find that every kilometer, you're still putting out a couple of grams from the embodied carbon amortized. And it's probably still better to keep the old car going. How are we coming up with these numbers and can we always rely on them? No, you can't rely on them. These numbers are often picked out of the air. There are different ways of looking at things. There are different systems. There are... The checks and balances aren't all there. In building products, they've tried to standardize it. But with everything else, all these companies are making up their own rules all the time. Unilever said all of their food is going to be carbon neutral by such and such. And then they gave that up because they actually couldn't figure out in the whole supply chain what everything actually was. There is a motorcycle company in Sweden that said they were going to build a zero carbon motorbike, electric motorbike, and they threw up their hands and gave up because inside that electric motor were 500 parts from all over China and they couldn't get the data on anything. And they said, well, all we can tell you is the footprint of the basic frame of the bike that we make. So when you get into all of these things, it gets very complicated and opaque and hard to figure it out. There's few standards, especially when you get out of the building industry. There are no standards. And so you just have to muddle through. Have we fully explained what upfront carbon actually is? Good point. We should do that. The common term in the industry is embodied carbon. You know, many years ago, 20 years ago, everyone used to talk about embodied energy, the energy that went into making something. And then with the Paris Accord and with everything like that, people started thinking, well, we used to really worry about energy. Now we have to worry about carbon. And so whereas embodied energy was the energy that went into making something, embodied carbon is the carbon that is emitted making something. Embodied by definition means it's in it. And I said, no, it's not in it. It's in the atmosphere. You can't call it embodied carbon. It's gone. And I was having a Twitter discussion about this with a New Zealand architect, L. Ron Burrell, and an Australian architect, George Chappas. We say, we've got to come up with a better name. And, you know, vomited carbon, spit carbon, all of these disgusting images, which we wanted. And finally, George said, you know, let's not get so rude. You know, what about just up front? And... I thought, this is great. And I started saying, let's call embodied carbon up front. And it wouldn't have gone anywhere except George was part of a group in the UK, the World Green Building Council, that wrote a pamphlet called Bringing Embodied Carbon Up Front. And inside they used up front. And now in most of the world, the term up front is used for a portion of embodied carbon up to the point where a building is occupied. I think it should be used for everything, but I'm just happy. And many people credit me with it, but it's really George and Elrond and Twitter and the three of us together. But it is the carbon that is emitted up front 
before you unpack your iPhone, before you step over the threshold of your new house, which is usually the deadline where it stops being upfront carbon. You take delivery, it's yours. And some people argue, well, it should be earlier, it should be where it comes out of the factory, because delivery could be to all different places, and that's impossible to calculate. I just say, think of it to the point that it's in your hands. I had a student who actually analyzed a pencil for her class, and it was a brilliant, brilliant examination because the Stadler pencil was made in Nuremberg from clay from Pennsylvania and graphite from Turkey and cedar from California, and all of these things came together in a pencil in Nuremberg, which was shipped to the store in um, Aurora, Ontario, north of Toronto, and the carbon emissions from her driving to the store and bringing it home were twice as big as the whole manufacture of the pencil and shipping everything all over the world. So this again tells you a story about upfront carbon. It's important, but you've got to know you got a bicycle to the store to pick it up or it's all worthless. <laughs> So you've got a whole section in the book which is going to dig into that more and the specific process that it, go, it sounds like it's a few things it's if you're getting the materials to begin with it's the movement about that transportation do they fall into categories that we can yes, list or they do i mean the the building people have actually figured all this out where they have categories from a1 to a5 which is mining which is manufacturing processing which is delivery and which is building into the building and the a4 and the a5 the delivery and the assembly of the buildings are the ones that are really hard to calculate because they're obviously different in every case or as this kid driving to aurora and then going home that would be in that transportation thing which would be huge for her pencil in buildings, it's much less so, and there are huge arguments going on right now about what is it actually. Some people say, well, it's only 3%, and other people say, no, it's 30%, you're just not counting it right. It's all very controversial. What I come back with every single time is the one thing that is true of absolutely everything, that if you use less stuff, you're going to be putting out less upfront carbon. And it's the conclusion that I come around to in almost every issue. Now, obviously, if you are building something out of straw, it's going to have lower upfront carbon emissions than if you build it out of aluminum and foam insulation, that we have to think about using the lowest upfront carbon materials in everything that we make. Like I will always buy a wood pencil rather than a mechanical metal pencil, just if you have a choice. And I will always use a bicycle instead of a car if I have a choice. The ultimate thing is just how much of everything are we using? Well, I don't mind underlining that a few more times. Since we're in this construction area, let's knuckle down on a couple of things okay. here. I know you mentioned your apartment section of the book of when you were looking at. So can you describe that for us? Well, again, the problem is in building design, people think, oh, if I just build it out of the right materials, say mass timber, then I will be doing the right thing because mass timber has a lower upfront carbon emissions than steel and concrete. But mass timber, for instance, can be used really inefficiently. I know one architect in the States who wanted a 10-meter, 30-foot grid because that's what traditional offices are and is more flexible if you want to convert it to other uses. And he was very proud of these giant wood beams that it took to build it to this 30-foot grid. Huge chunks of wood. But he thought that was okay because wood sequesters carbon. So if I'm using big beams, I'm storing more carbon. This is an argument that a lot of people who use wood say all the time. But again, you know, people aren't sure how much of it is really stored in the wood, how much of it is left in the ground in roots, or how much is just the slash, the small branches and the leaves that are left on the ground. Does it actually work to your benefit to use more wood? And the consensus is no. The consensus now is generally no. You want to use as little as possible. 
And there's one architect in London, one of the pioneers in mass timber construction, Andrew Waugh of Waugh Thistleton, who's really been the world leader in it. And he knew that I'd been writing about this, and I would have thought, he was getting mad at me for always saying, you know, you got to use less wood, you got to use less wood. But he took me to his absolutely gorgeous black and white building in London that opened last year. And the first thing he said was, look at these columns. We're using 40% less fiber, 40% less material per square meter than we did 10 years ago. We're constantly refining and revising and learning so that we can use less material, less fiber. Because he really, you know, if you're going to sequester more carbon, you're chopping down more trees, you've got to plant more trees. And you know, nobody knows exactly how much carbon is emitted and how much is sequestered. And after my last trip to the UK, where I was speaking to everyone I could about wood, I went back and spoke to a Canadian wood expert. And I said, I'm so frustrated. I'm trying to figure out what is the carbon footprint of a cubic meter of wood. And nobody will tell me. Nobody seems to know. And this guy said, you never will find out because it's impossible. Every forest is different. I could take you to 140 different forest types just in the province of British Columbia in Canada. And this one has deep roots and this one has shallow roots. And this one got a lot of rain and the thing developed this way. And this developed this way that every tree is different. Every forest is different. Every way they cut it is different. The only thing that we can say is make sure that you get certified wood from FSC certification where you know it's going to be carefully harvested and replanted. And again, use as little as possible. So that means you're going to see buildings with sort of tighter grids. They're not going to try for the 10 meter grid. You should see simpler, boxier buildings. We should stop this insane competition to be, we're the tallest wood building in the world. I said, no, you don't want to be the tallest wood building because then the columns are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and you're putting in more and more fiber and you've got to deal with harder fire regulations and all of these things. And there was a wonderful study by uh, Professor Hans Goetsch, I forget which English university, where he built this great computer model and twisted all these dials and basically came up with, you want boxy buildings about six stories high with wood construction, with windows that are pretty small and flat facades and no brick. And this has like 50% of the upfront carbon of every other building. And if you go to Austria or you go to uh, much of Germany and you look at all of the new apartment buildings they're building, that's what everything is. You can do this. So when you start looking in terms of upfront carbon, architecture really changes. But architects like big windows. Architects like lots of glass. It's easier to design. One thing I will say here is this hope for the future that when new architects, new builders come up, that they can almost take the baton from where we are rather than trying to make all the mistakes all over again and come up with these things. Because there's so much just logic, common sense and simplicity in some of these things that feels like have been discovered, but then it's the communicating side of getting it out there. Well, yes, like the one person I when I came to... London this time. I didn't spend a lot of time running around to meet people, but there was one person I really wanted to meet, an engineer named Steve Webb of Webb Yates, who has been exploring the possibility of stone. And I asked him when I was writing an article for an American publication to send me a letter, and he said these things that were just amazing. He said, you know, look at concrete. How do you make concrete? You take limestone, you grind it up into a powder, you put it in a kiln at 1450 degrees Celsius, you then mix it with a bit of clay and aggregate to make what? Stone. You're basically making artificial stone. So if I go to a quarry, cut out the limestone, cut it into blocks, drill a hole in it, put a cable through it as reinforcing, I can make a beam out of stone that's stronger than the beam out of concrete with a tenth of the upfront carbon emissions, and it will last five times as long. I said, why aren't we doing this? 
making concrete is perverse. And he's absolutely right. There are a couple of other things that you wanted to get to. What's heat pumps? Ah, heat pumps. This is a really, really interesting thing because there's a big conflict going on. Heat pumps, you know, everybody's had heat pumps for as long as we've been alive because if you've got a refrigerator, you've got a heat pump. It's moving heat from inside the box to outside the box. That's what an air conditioner did. Move the heat from inside your box to outside the box. What a heat pump is, is you're just putting the air conditioner in backwards and it's taking the heat from the outside air and bringing it into the inside air. And everybody says that they don't work at cold weather. There's not enough heat. And I said, really? Zero degrees Celsius is 270 degrees Kelvin, going right back to absolute zero. And, you know, 20 degrees Celsius is 293. I mean, the difference between 293 and 273 is very, very small as a percentage. There's still a lot of rapidly moving molecules with heat in them. And I was doing a whole thing in my LinkedIn thing. I said, wow, it's a balmy 270 degrees in Toronto today, you know, three below Celsius and that. And when you think about that, you said, no, there's lots of heat to pull out of the air and to move. And so that's what heat pumps do. And there's a big argument going on now that was started by a Canadian who looked at people doing really efficient buildings with urethane foam insulation. And urethane foam insulation has huge, huge upfront carbon emissions from making it from the the gas that they use that they blow up the bubbles in the foam with. And he pointed out that if He'd just done the thing to regular crappy building code over its life, over 50 years. It would still have the crappy building code house. Even gas fired would have lower carbon emissions than the super efficient one. And I first learned this seven years ago and it made my head explode because it meant that everything we were doing was wrong with sort of going super insulation, 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 reduce energy consumption. But if we were doing it with foam, the cure was worse than the disease. And in Europe here, they quickly figured this out and banned those gases that were used before. And so foam has gotten much, much better. But this is why you're seeing so many people getting so interested in insulations like cellulose and straw and wood fiber because they don't use any greenhouse gases. The point is, is that now suddenly people were saying, well, If we've got heat pumps and we've got clean electricity, which electricity grid is getting cleaner and cleaner, then really we don't need to worry about efficiency. We're not worried about energy. We're worried about carbon. And if I've got a heat pump and I've got zero carbon energy and slap that in together, then why bother insulating so much? And the, the, the answer is I read this. I heard this from an engineer named Toby Cambry who wrote about it in Passive House Plus magazine. And it also said, oh, do we have to rethink this? Do I have to rethink deep energy retrofits? Do they make sense? Another Canadian who works in the UK, Kelly Alvarez Dora, said, no, you look at the embodied carbon of triple glazing compared to single glazing and the energy, you look at it over the life of the window and it'll take 200 years for the triple glazing to pay for itself because the frames are heavier, the glass is heavier, everything is multiplied when you go triple glazed. And a lot of people reacted negatively to this to point out that there's no such thing as zero carbon electrons. Even if you live in Ontario where I live, they're part of a bigger grid. They sell electricity to the states, electricity comes back. We're all in a big pool and people are still generating electricity from coal in some places. And if you don't burn it here, then it can be exported to replace some coal that they're burning in Poland. So you still have to reduce energy consumption as much as you can. You can't just ignore it and say, I'm going to heat pumpify. This was Toby Toby Cambry's things. Which do we need more of, insulation or heat pumpification? Which became my new term, heat pumpification. And the answer is you need both. You need both. It's just one can come first, can't it? Yes. So long as you're planned. Yes, that's what the ACB and other organizations are saying. Well, get the heat pump first. And I said, no, 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 because the heat pump you're going to get is bigger than you need it to be. 
And the refrigerants that go into heat pumps are really dangerous greenhouse gases, and they leak. They leak much more than people know. Like they leak 2 to 5% per year, and if you've got a crappy installer coming to fix it, it can all blow out in one shot. And there are new refrigerants that they call natural. I don't call propane natural because it comes from natural gas and that, but that are not fluorocarbons and have very low greenhouse gas emissions, like just three times carbon dioxide, whereas the artificial refrigerants are like 300 and 3,000 times. But heat pumps can only be a certain size because propane is flammable. So it's limited to, I think, a kilo. And that means that's a limit on how much area can heat or cool. I don't care what you do, if you get up to the point, you can still use an R290 or propane heat pump. And the two ways you can get down to the size of an R290 heat pump is use more insulation for more efficiency or build less stuff, live in a smaller space. And so once you start thinking of this whole picture, yes, you can go heat pumps, but no, you've got to go with a low greenhouse gas refrigerant, which limits the size of the heat pump. These are the things you have to weigh. I think there's always a logic of going down the fabric first route because it will give you health and comfort yes, and all so of those always things. Have to first. remember comfort. And what about if the grid fell over one time? You still get those to a degree. Obviously, ventilation might not work, but it's so yeah, there are, there's lots to consider. Well, that's another point that I make in my book that everyone forgets about. I have this whole chapter of things that you can do and words ending in why. One of them is intermittency. The thing about this new world we're getting into where we're relying on renewables for everything is renewables are intermittent. And if you live in a drafty old 1913 house like I do, when the furnace goes off, which I should very briefly explain, happens quite often in my house because my boiler is connected to my water heater. And if in the middle of the winter, my daughter takes an hour long shower, it empties the water heater and the furnace's computer insists on going to the water heater before it goes to heat. And I can't fix that. So turn off the heat in the middle of winter because my daughter has a shower and you can just see the temperature in the house drop like three or four degrees in a couple of hours. Now, if you live in a really well insulated or passive house, if the furnace goes off or if the utility actually decides to use your house as a thermal battery and pay you to turn off the heat for a little bit of time, which they can, well, suddenly you can start shaving the peaks you know, they have to design an electrical system for the country not to do the general demand, but they have to cope with the peaks, the coldest, darkest days in winter. If they can't do that, like, what's the point? So we have to get really smart about shaving the peaks. And we shave the peaks by designing our houses to be really, really efficient so that if the heat goes off for an hour and the hot water heater goes off, you don't notice it. And someday it'll be so smart that we'll connect our electric car to the house and all of the electric cars with the thousands of batteries in those electric cars. And the electrical system can then for the whole country be designed around the fact, okay, it's January and it's dark and it's the middle of winter. And for the next six hours, we're just going to keep everybody warm by running it off their cars and not needing much energy because our buildings are so efficient. This is the world we have to look for because electricity batteries can only store so much, but we're putting huge numbers of batteries into our cars. And if we take advantage of all of that, then, you know, the, everything changes. So this is why designing for intermittency is so important. And the way you design for intermittency is with lots of insulation and good quality windows. I'm going to move us on a bit now because I know you're getting hungry. It's nearly lunchtime. So no, let's no, talk I'm about just... hamburgers. OK. <laughs> <laughs> you wonder where I was going there, didn't yes, you? Yes, <laughs> I, I said, no, no, I can keep going. I can keep talking. But yes, 
One of the things that I really wanted to do with this book, and I say all the time, it's not about buildings. I was at a building conference just the other night, and in LinkedIn, the other people say, oh, we have to talk more about embodied carbon. And somebody said, oh, I can't wait for Lloyd Alter's book. I said, no, 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 it's not as much about building materials. I also talk about puffer jackets and hamburgers. And hamburgers I find fascinating because in my first book, I talked about them simply because the carbon footprint of beef is very high and eating a hamburger will kill your daily carbon allowance because each one is, oh, I think it was about five kilograms of carbon emissions just from the hamburger. But what the chapter in my book was about was really about the societal importance of the hamburger. And this is, I think, more uh, an American, a North American story than a British one. I think there are British equivalent foods. I keep hearing about butties. I don't know exactly what a butty is, but... You might have a bacon butty or something like that, a roll sandwich. But you eat it with your hands. That's the point. Exactly. And the hamburger was actually invented in a World's Fair in the States in the 1880s, and it was called a Hamburg steak. And it didn't become a hamburger until all these stands started opening up outside factories where the Hamburg steak was squeezed between two pieces of bread and later a bun. And this was portable food. And what portable food meant was that post the Second World War, when people were driving everywhere because they suddenly had highways and they suddenly had cars and they were all moving to the suburbs, basically McDonald's was able to open and they were able to... Running a restaurant's expensive when you have seats and you have waitresses and you have waiters and you have dishes to clean and all of that and it takes a lot of space and these guys opened up a stand where you came up to the window and you got your burger wrapped in a piece of paper and they offloaded all the real estate of a restaurant to you sitting in your car and so the hamburger post second world war became a story of the evolution of the car in North America to have cup holders for everything and fold down trays. And I was just taking pictures at an auto show of a new pickup truck that actually had the center console folded out and you could lay out a whole dinner on the space between the driver and the passenger seat. It was insanely huge. And it's one of the reasons that these vehicles just got bigger and bigger and bigger because they're now mobile dining rooms. And this is how people eat so much of their food in North America in their cars. And so what started as like a piece of meat between two pieces of bread actually is a profound influence on our entire lives on, you know, how we eat, where we eat, what we eat has all become every one of them incredibly and carbon intensive. I looked at a study about the average emissions for idling in your car, waiting to get up to the takeout window. And it was close to a kilogram of carbon just in emissions from your average American pickup truck, which everybody's driving, till they get to the gate. It's not as much as the hamburger, but it's huge. Not to mention getting the bigger cars meant these vehicles have much more metal, much more stuff in them. They've switched from making them out of steel to making them out of aluminum, which has all its own issues of making aluminum. The whole thing, you start with the humble little hamburger and it's, well, Carl Sagan in one of, I think, his most brilliant lines, um, if you want to know how to make an apple pie, you have to invent the universe. But basically said, you know, everything goes back to the fundamental roots. Well, where did the apple come from? Where did photosynthesis come from? Where did the sun come from? You know, it never ends. And it's the same with carbon. It's the same with the hamburger. You know, you can follow things back down. This is actually a line from Mike Berners-Lee in his book about boundaries, like where does it stop in your calculation? If you start going down the rabbit hole of carbon, it never ends. Is there any way to visualize the carbon? Because we, we talk a lot about the weight, don't we, in our allowance? Oh, it's, it's very hard. It was a very funny thing. And I found it particularly with my students. 
because carbon dioxide is a gas, so you don't visualize gases as having weights because they float up in the air. And ever since we started worrying about carbon, people have been doing things to visualize it. So you'll see cars with giant balloons behind them, and they're showing the balloon the size of the carbon. And another person envisioned balloons and showed them all piling up around the Empire State Building and all of this. And Balloons, I thought, okay, that works. And the Cake Motorcycle Company designed a box the size of the carbon and hung their motorcycle in the middle of it. And I don't know, I thought volume isn't the way to do it. And one of my students, when this assignment where they had to pick an object and they picked a piece of paper and the manufacture of the paper was so many grams and the logging of the tree was so many grams. And then the transport of the piece of paper by train was 27 kilograms. And I said, well, wait a second, wait a second. How can transport, you're off by a factor of maybe 10,000 on this. People don't visualize weight. So I tried to think of things, you know, in my book, I was going to have a bunch of symbols by everything. Like I started with barbells, you know, my watch is 80 kilograms of carbon in it. So, you know, 80 kilograms of weight. So people could visualize that, but it got awkward. And then I thought joking, I always remembered from high school that Love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, where Prufrock says, I've measured my life in coffee spoons. So I went and measured a coffee spoon and figured out what the carbon footprint of a coffee spoon was. But they're little. It was only 26 grams. So that wasn't going to work. I'd need thousands of coffee spoons. And then I just thought of old Roadrunner Wiley E. Coyote movies and looked and said, oh, An anvil, they weigh about 200 pounds. That's about 100 kilograms. I'll just measure everything in anvils. And I started doing this with my students. I said, that piece of paper, you know, you got this wrong, is like 60 anvils here worth of... And when they started visualizing things in terms of anvils dropping on Wile E. Coyote's head, they started thinking about the picture differently. So my MacBook Air computer. It's an Air because it was light as air, right? That's why it was called that. But it's an anvil and a half. My watch is half an anvil. And when you start thinking of things in terms of anvils, instead of vague kilograms of carbon, you begin to realize that it's heavy. It matters. It makes a big difference. And that your car that you may think only weighs three tons or... 30 anvils is really 200 anvils. And it's like giant piles of iron everywhere. And I thought this was a more useful way to visualize things. We've talked through a few different examples, and I know there'll be more in the book, which we can explore. But maybe we could just finish up today with looking at some sufficiency strategies You've mentioned the obvious one, which is just buy less of everything and keep size down. Right. I think that we have to start right now rethinking the way we do standards and codes and everything, which everything is done. For instance, the Passive House standard says you can have so many kilowatts of power per square meter. Our building codes say your walls should be so much resistance, a U value or R value and that, and they should be this high. Cars are all sort of fuel efficiency, so many gallons per kilometer. I think we have to start figuring out, instead of relative standards, we have to start thinking of everything in absolute standards. How much carbon as each of us entitled to in a year or in our lifetime? What is our carbon allotment? I hate to use the word ration, but it's the word that we may have to start using and say, okay, if you want to build a house that's going to be only 50 square meters or 80 square meters, which was what everybody built after the Second World War, families were raised in 80 to 100 square meters, then You get a carbon allowance for heating and cooling, especially if it's a heat pump of this much energy. Well, that house, because you've got your energy allowance, it could actually be built less expensively. That person could be comfortable with a little less insulation, double glazed windows. It's not going to be as comfortable as triple glazed, but it's better than leaky, terrible things. So if you're building 
lower cost housing, you could maybe say slightly lower standard because it's small. But if someone wants to build 500 square meters and has the same carbon allowance, they're going to have to really be careful and they're going to have to build it to a really high standard. And then if you start saying, oh, by the way, this isn't just, you don't just get an operating allowance, but you get an upfront carbon allowance, you're only allowed to have this much carbon allowance to build your whole house. Well, then they're suddenly going to be looking at saying, the only way I can build my mansion is if I build it out of straw and hemp on wood pile foundations you're telling me i can't do my as they say in north america my mcmansion what do you use for a mcmansion in in the uk do you use that term or do you have something else we know what that is a mcmansion but i think it would just be a mansion okay (laughs) and you know what materials do we use steve webb was telling me you know if you cut a brick out of stone cut the same piece of stone out to the same size you've got a tenth the carbon emissions. And then he said, why are we using stupid bricks anyway? How did we come up with bricks? It's because it's a guy can pick it up and deal with it. It makes no sense to have such a small unit. And why aren't we rethinking all of this? And I look at all British houses and say, why do you use so much brick in the first place? It's incredibly carbon intensive. So suddenly when we start thinking about these, you say, well, I have to use materials that are lower carbon, and I have to use less of them. It's amazing what good designers can do with small spaces if they're good and are thoughtful about. It's amazing what good architects can do when you know, say, oh, I can't make the windows so small, the housing will look terrible. But good architects manage it all the time. You just have to have an eye for proportion and detail. There's Goldsmith Street, Passive Houses. They're absolutely brilliant. And I was talking to the architect about them. And if you look at the window of them, the window opening in the brick is that big, but the bottom third of it is actually a panel set back. So your eye reads it as a bigger window, but the window itself is small. Or the engineer, Nick Grant, said, you know, let's just design windows for light and view and connection to the outdoors. Whereas every architect I've ever known always designs first, you know, how do we make this facade look good? You know, the window gets to be this big without giving as much thought to going from the inside and just saying, how do we make it as small as we can get away with to do the thing we need it to do? Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground today. Is there anything you'd either like to add or just highlight from our conversation today? Well, I think the main thing that I want to highlight is that we've all thought about, we've had for 50 years since the sort of oil crisis of the 70s, we've had been obsessed with efficiency, 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 efficiency. And in this new world of upfront carbon, we have to turn that in its head and start thinking about sufficiency. How much do we need? And this goes through everything. How much clothing do I need? How much food should I be buying? How big is my car or do I need a car? How big is my house? All of these things, everything we do, we should look at it. And I often say, my phrase, and I start my book is, when you look at the world through the lens of upfront carbon, everything changes. You just start thinking differently about everything you do and everything you buy. And I'll leave it at that. I always enjoy our chats. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you. Get more in our show notes today, which will include a summary, also some links to where you can buy the story of Upfront Carbon, Lloyd on socials. That's probably where we should continue the conversation. All of this at houseplanninghelp.com slash 355. My call to action is to check out the hub, particularly if you've never done this before. Why have you never done this before? It's where we continue providing information, content, resources that will be really useful as you go about either building new 
or retrofitting an existing dwelling. And so much of it is in the preparation, which is why we're always focusing on the decisions that are being made and how you get yourself in a good place. So access our digital archive full of different things. In fact, hold on, we've added one here. This is a live training session. We like to bring in guest experts and it's with architect Josh Wood. We're going through the process of going from site appraisal, looking at client brief, and then how concepts come out of that. So he's going to explain how he works. It's obviously always slightly different, but it's just interesting to see that side of things because you may well, when you start interacting with design professionals, not have a clue. Where did these come from? So that's what we explored in that session. We've got all our other bits and pieces, ask the experts, the courses, the forum, the in-depth video case studies and office hours. Find out more, houseplanninghelp.com slash join. Kim Mead is my guest next time. We're looking at Passive House Certification. How does it fit into the whole process? Where do we engage? Do we even need it? How much does it cost? Everything you need to know next time. Thanks so much for listening. The House Planning Help podcast is produced by Regen Media, content that matters.